Well, the next uh, session, ladies and gentlemen, this is in fact a key session. Uh, this is going to be a fireside chat, and this is going to be phenomenal because uh, there's, there's going to be a phenomenal woman joining us on the stage. This has to be absolutely unmissable, I must say. So I would need all your attention in that on the stage. And uh, you know, sometimes you, uh, we wonder why is it the curry cooking. So she will help us uh, uh, decide, and she will help us um, on the on, on the fact and on on the fact that how do we really scale businesses with technology? So she talk about that and more. But but, but you know, before I invite her and our conversationalist on the stage. Uh, Allow me to share, uh, you know, back then uh, we remember about the coaching classes where the teacher used to teach like 50, 60 students and it was limited to a few good uh, teachers, also the location and the timing was a constraint. Now you have to believe how technology has really democratized the entire education scenario, the saga making online education available without sort of any of those boundaries and I must say she is uh, one of those front runners, the co-founder of Baijus, ladies and gentlemen, which is the world leading at the company and as a teacher and a member of the board, she, I'm so proud to read, is a firm believer in curiosity-led learning, a strong supporter of women at work. Uh, well, a mother to two young children, uh, featured on Fortune 40 and the 40 Entrepreneur 2022 list, Forbes Asia's 25 most powerful women. Well, there's so many other ladies you would need next 15 minutes to talk about that. But what do you think the fireside chat is going to be a leader's talk for sure? Uh, it's going to talk about scaling businesses with technology, as I said. But first of all, let me please invite a conversationalist, our very own Shraddha Kamdar, the deputy editor, Femina. Please welcome Shraddha. With a good round of cheers, Shraddha is going to be in conversation with the one I was speaking about. I would all of you to please raise the excitement meter as you are to the co founder of iTunes. Please welcome Olivia. Welcome now, everybody. Thank you so much, Olivia, for your stunning presence on the stage. And Shraddha, when she said curry is cooking, I said the only thing I don't know is how to cook. And I was so stressed uh, when she said that. She's talking about me, you know. Don't worry, we're not talking about that. You know, but I can <laughs> show you. <laughs> oh, dear Shraddha, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we begin, I mean, before I begin the chat with uh, Divya, both of us have one question for each one of you. Uh, raise your hand if you use a search engine, primarily Google, to look up something today. Is it almost everyone or can I say at least 99%? So we, 100. So we did, we, we all use technology to learn something. And that's the seed with which I'm going to lead. Uh, she began with, as a teacher with Baijus. So, you began as a teacher with Baijus and you remain a teacher at heart, we know that. Can you um, tell us if even today you find some time to conduct a class with students to, you know, make that rewarding experience for yourself? Okay, thank you, Shraddha. Thank you for having me and thank you, everybody. First, I want to say that Shraddha looks more like the teacher I looked when I walked into the first class when I was 21 years old uh, today. So, she's playing the role of the teacher. And uh, I wanted to take a break from the teacher role and so I just turned up in very casual clothes. But when I look at her, I actually remember how my journey started. I was 21 and I entered my first class. And today when I think about it, I say, oh my god, I've been an entrepreneur since then. Right? And I walked in, it was a gallery style class, 100 students, um, three or four years younger than me because I was helping them get a job that, you know, would shape that career. And uh, I mean, I just stayed back. I wore a sari so that I looked a little bit older than I was. And it helps because today in five minutes I can wear it. It's amazing. Yeah. So it, it, it's just something that there was something, institution, I guess. And I love what happened that day. I love the impact. And then they got their job and they came and said thank you. It not just made my day, it just gave me purpose. So I was scheduled to go abroad and do my master's in biotechnology. My aunt is a biotechnologist and she was actually waiting. And I would sit in the garden to welcome me to the US. It was the coolest thing to do. 15 years ago. Uh, but then, you know, I just feel things would not have turned out better. And here I am today. Uh, started as a teacher. Uh, 
uh, have done a bunch of things, like we would all do. Some people ask me, what's your role in the company? And I say, you don't ask a mother what her role is in bringing up her child. So that is the role that all of us play as songwriters, as leaders, and as entrepreneurs while bringing up our company. And yes, even today, whenever I get a chance, I love to teach. Uh, so I'm in Bombay for three days. I would go to one of our centers and teach. I was in Delhi last week. I went to a student's house, I spoke to her and I just tried to figure out what she would uh, you know, like more. And she took five minutes to recognize me. She was looking at that, she was looking at me, like, oh my god, this is the same person. And I found that so sweet, so I spoke about it on LinkedIn. And uh, in Bangalore, whenever I get time, I go to one of our education for all schools, which is our social initiative. So I'm a teacher at heart. Always am, always will be. That's amazing, and you inspire so many. But today, I want to ask you one very, I want to start with this very important question. We all know that uh, Betty stepped into the virtual world uh, in the field of education when technology was at a very, very nascent stage. I remember when talking about the satellite, using satellites at that point. And uh, so when you did that, what was his vision, what was your vision, what was the company's vision then? company's vision was to go one student at a time, one step at a time. And when we started, we started in, a, you know, today it's cool to say coffee shop, but the coffee shops 15 years ago were not the Starbucks of the day. So, small place, and we started from there, that's the idea of great content, reaching people, how do we scale it? So, classrooms became auditoriums, became stadiums, and at one point we were conducting sessions for 25,000 students at a time. And then we were like, wait a minute, if this has to go from thousands to millions, the only way we can do it is with technology. So like we said in 2014, we used, and 2013, 14, we started using VSAT technology to scale and we realized it was the content which was pulling people and helping them learn better. So in 2015, we actually launched our learning app. It is the same year that Digital India was launched. So July was when Digital India started or was launched and uh, August was when Baiju's learning app was launched. So the India story and the Baiju story is actually very strongly intertwined with each other. And if you see what's happened over the last, uh, I would say 80 odd months since it has launched, today we have 150 million students across the world and that's possible because of technology. But technology can enable scale but we also used it for two more things. Right? One is to enable personalization because what we realized is in our stadium sessions they are not able to personalize learning to the style, the size, the pace of each and every student. Right. When we have a choice of color, when we have a choice of stationery, why should we not have the choice of learning the way we mm -hmm. and are comfortable learning. That was the same mission with which we started the company. That's how we created all our products. So from teaching in front of the classes, classroom, we started teaching in front of the camera. Right. I started writing the scripts with four other teachers. And, and in 2015, when we launched the app, so 2013 was when my first son was born. Mm -hmm. And my students, since the, since the videos are since then, they would see me go from this to this and back to this. Right. So I've, I've also evolved as a person, as a mother. And, and I also believe I became a better teacher after becoming a parent. And in 2015, our app was launched and my elder son actually pressed the button in office at 11.30 at night. So for me, my personal journey, my professional journey has all been, you know, so intertwined. It's dangerous too, but then if you love what you do so much, I mean, it, it just becomes one mission and one story and one journey. And uh, that, that's, that's how we scale, that's how we do. So we use tech to enable access, we use tech to help in personalization, we use tech to make learning simple, fun, engaging, with movie-like videos and games-like interaction. We saw that kids love uh, watching videos on their phone, but we were like, okay, then if they're watching videos, why don't they watch learning videos? Let's make them love learning. That was a simple mission. And that's how we, we scaled, that's how we grew. The pandemic was a hyper growth phase for us. The only challenge we had before the pandemic was the challenge of awareness. Can online learning be a part of mainstream learning? Today, everybody would say yes. Yes, I agree with I, I know what you mean, you know. We, we started this phase like people started using technology to overcome barriers. Like you said, it's not just for learning, but also for uh, overcoming geographic barriers. And now the mobile phone is able to reach technology at the most far-flung areas. 
So then two things will come of this. One that you said is about personalization. The one size fits all approach doesn't work, especially when you want uh, students to be lifelong learners. And the second thing that comes of it is championing education for all. So can you tell us a little bit about how Bajus is doing both these things? You know, overcoming this thing of one size fits all, which we've we've both we've all seen within the classroom, outside the classroom, that it's it's still that process where the teacher is teaching and very often the student is left to their own pace to learn. So how does Bedrooms overcome this? And the second thing, like I said, championing education fraud. That's a very relevant question and I think being in the segment of education, it has the benefits of a double bottom line of doing well and doing good. Okay? So, it's you can do well and you can also do good. Now, what do I mean by that? Today we have 70 lakh, okay, or 7 million paying students. Mm -hmm. But just over the last 24 months, we have 5.5 million or 55 lakh students who are learning with us for free. The same content in 12 regional languages, reaching the depths of the country, we did it in a very simple way, solving the challenge of cost, quality, and scale. We just you know, partnered with 175 NGOs, given the same content, the same product, and it doesn't plagiarize our business model at all. Because one is business and one is beyond business. These are children who could have never afforded to purchase our product, but now are able to benefit from it because we've already invested heavily in great content, and now at zero cost, we're scaling into them. So 55 lakh students, half of them are girls, and you know, initially when we started, we said, okay, one million in one year, one million in five years, by 2025, we did it in one year. Then we said, okay, five million by 2025, we've already done 5.5 million. So now I'm not going to stop, and I'm not going to stop till I reach the bottom 100 million students in India, okay, and I make sure that they are getting the same quality education, uh, because education really is for all. And you know, on the sidelines, I'm also seeing how it's empowering mothers. Right. So, organically, and we didn't put any effort in this. We are seeing that there are 20,000 mothers who are going to give their class 10 exams next year just because their children have access to education for all. So, this, in a way, is, is empowering, you know, not just one person but their entire family. That's, that's, you know, sincerely extremely amazing because you have reached at points where you never thought you would. You said you're not going to stop your a classic example of seven hour unstoppable is that much I'm going to sell you and take some time to tell you. But also, when you started, um, two, two part question again is um, what are some of the learnings that you've had which others can learn from you think following your footsteps? And the second thing is, is that something you would share with us which you wish you knew before. You've come to know it now in so many years, but you wish you knew it before. So I've been someone who's been very heads down and hearts in, mm -hmm. right? So uh, maybe in the last two years or two and a half years, you would see me coming out and speaking, <laughs> right? And But but my journey is not four years old, it's 15 years old. Yesterday somebody joked and asked me, you started when you were a child. <coughs> I said no, I was 21. And you know, so I have come to understand the importance of sharing your story with people, of meeting like minded leaders, entrepreneurs, bringing up people from within, understanding the importance of creating your leadership team from people within your organization and not really pulling in people from outside. So, all of these things I have learned. Uh, and maybe over time I also understood because I am a big planner. Uh, there are two things which have, you know, reduced my planning uh, cape, like, you know, the, the, way I, the way in which I planned too much. When I, when I started out, I used to probably plan weeks ahead. So now I've understood that you can have yearly goals and you can have monthly goals, but it should have weekly and daily. Because you don't know what's going to change, what's going to happen. The world changes every day. So you need to be ready for change, and change is the only constant. People also say the only way to predict the future is to kind of create it. So we've been trying to evolve with the times. We've been trying to learn that even though we are 150 million students strong and 50,000 employees strong, uh, it's important that you continue to be flexible, to innovate, to ideate, to be agile, to adapt. So the 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 piece that comes with a big company, you should always have the strengths of a startup, and you should think like one.
that's amazing. That's something that people should know because that's what we are here to do. Learn from uh, one who's been ahead, one who's been a trailblazer. Uh, what are some of the things that you might want to tell uh, a startup in terms of scaling the technology? You've done it beautifully with Bajos. So. One thing I want to tell, okay, so two, three things. Right? One is that in terms of diversity, especially in tech, and I don't need to say that in a room which is dedicated to diversity in technology, but the fact is that the more diverse uh, your problem solver is, which is what we are, your problem solvers, your problem solvers at scale, they're addressing a need in society. So unless you have diversity, you cannot have a multi dimensional approach to growth, problem solving, and solution creation. So ensure diversity and ensure it's its inception because the minute you do that, you don't need to worry about it later on. So we have 40% women and that's because it's not an afterthought. We never thought about diversity later on. It was just there from the beginning and it also helps that we are in education. So we're empowering people. Mm -hmm. We've added 20,000 teachers in the last two years, mostly women teaching from home to the rest of the world. So it can really empower and enable. The second thing I want to say is that when you start a company, uh, it doesn't matter what the weather is outside, whether it's a funding winter or a coming summer. Right? What matters is that you have a great idea. You don't need $10 million to start a business in some segments. You need three people with passion, with dedication, the lifetime goal, mission to make anything happen and not take no for an answer. That's what you need to start a company. And you need to be addressing the need in society. And remember that for the first six years, we were bootstrapped too. There are four phases for every startup. There is seed, there is early, there is growth, and then there is maturity. Right? So seed and early, if you can figure out where you develop the product, right? figure out the product market fit. All of this we did with zero external investment. So we explored, we experimented, and we invested our profits back in our business because we were completely profitable. And then we grew. We had the first more advantage, we established a brand, and that's when people got to know about us. And then uh, finally, now we are ready to enter the final phase, which is the maturity phase, where it's about sustainable growth, where it's about profitability, where it's about long term impact and growth. Thank you, and I would like you to leave the women in the room and the women who are uh, watching later. Of course, we are Fevena and we are at Women in Technology. So, with one thought, that has always guided you, always helped you, and you know that we can help them and guide them. I'll keep it very short. The single thought, the single notion that should change, two, that women can take care and take charge, and men can take charge and take care. That's it. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Vidya Kokunath, co-founder of Bajus, thank you very much for being with us here today.